On the 20th day of October in the year 2020, Tony and TJ reviewed a movie that was their generations on Golden Dawn, the Bee Gees and Pete Frampton's Sgt. Peeper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. This was before producer Casey was even born. Hence, this deluxe reissue featuring the bells and whistles you've come to expect from the Untitled Beatles podcast. It's a long one, so I'm going to stop talking. Hey, before we get started, today's episode features an unfortunate technical error on TJ's audio, and so his magical piano playing was not captured. We can't leave the piano! Let's not discuss this any further. Therefore, I will be recreating that magic myself with a process known in the industry as sweetening. Yes! We have no producer. We have no producer today. Enjoy the show. Untitled Beatles podcast. I hear you. I hear the piano. I hear you, and you hear me. Audio test is best when it's all it notes and the key too high for me. <laughs> hey Tony, I want to kick things off the entitled Beatles podcast for today. We're just talking Hall and Oates. Tony's a big <laughs> H2O guy. I'm a big bamboo. We're gonna get into it after this. Daryl Hall and John Oates, their greatest and their latest on one album, Rock and Soul Part One on RCA Records and Cassettes. <laughs> we have a fucking sponsor. We're no, that yet. that yet. No, we we're on right, our and own. We're, and we're back. <laughs> I see you, and you see me. Welcome to the Untitled Beatles podcast, <laughs> Hall and Oates version. <laughs> Which is good because today's podcast is going to be to your great idea with Halloween being now ish. Yes. Um. Uh. Week of the Hall and Oates covering the Beatles. I don't know what happened. See, I have a look for the first time. But if it did, we could talk about it because we're not just going to be talking Beatles covers today, but a specific set of Beatles covers from a very specific moment in time, Tony. It's true. We're going to dive into the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band film. The movie. Yes. The, the much derided film from 1978. <laughs> It's true. It's true. Yeah, we both watched it. Uh, I believe we both own the soundtrack, the double LP, right? Oh, yeah. I, I think it, by law, every copy of it has a cutout on the album cover. I think everyone's <laughs> got, it was like in the bargain bin at Peaches. <laughs> <laughs> I love those cutouts. I used to actually work. Uh, I used to have to make the cutouts in CDs in a, in a warehouse in the, the late 90s. Really? For a... Yeah, for promotional stuff. Yeah, it was it was basically it was a saw set up and you would just take like 10 CDs and you'd drag them across the uh, you'd have to set it. You didn't want to do it too much. You know, <laughs> you wanted your cutout to be a little bit. But yeah, I did that. I, I was always fat. Like, I love seeing cutout vinyl and cutout cassettes. They kind of have the saw in it, too. But it's uh, it's just always interesting to see what became a cutout. There's a, a some Beatles product, like not just the Sgt. Pepper soundtrack, but I believe the Beatlemania album on Pear Records, the right. the, uh, the Broadway soundtrack reissue, yes. was one of the all time great cutouts. <laughs> As were a lot of the VJ fakes. You remember, like every record store had introducing the Beatles on VJ, but it was a, a fake. Oh, and like I missed the that. Beatles tell all, yeah, and like. The late 80s, they started flooding the market with fake VJ stuff. Like, I don't know if the Frank Ifield compilation was, was released. but <laughs> You'd love that Frank Ifield one. But the Beatles versus the Four Seasons. <laughs> and Frank Ifield, who? Yeah, now, Frank Ifield, he? Tony... He, well, I'll tell you who he is. He's no Frankie Howard. <laughs> and if you've seen Sgt. Pepper, we call that a mitzvah. There's so much to talk about on this movie. Yeah, let's do it, You right? said you'd only seen this. Uh, we always need to kind of reset our collective experience yes. with whatever the topic is. 
This was not new to you, but you hadn't seen this in a long time. Is that correct? Yeah, I rented it once somewhere and watched it, uh, you know, enjoyed it for what it was. But there's in rewatching it, there's definitely a lot of stuff I don't remember whatsoever. And I actually I liked it more than I thought I would like it. Uh, again. It's better than yesterday. Can we get that out of the way right Thank now? Thank you. The Sgt. Pepper movie <laughs> over yesterday, 10 out of 10. This gets five comparative fabs. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Five fabs for uh, the Sgt. Pepper movie. So, yeah, let's 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 do it. Let's do it, right? It came out in uh, July of 1978, directed by Michael Schultz, and it's a Robert Stigwood production, okay? Right? Grace is the it was kind of the, the Robert Stigwood uh, uh, trio. Yes. Started with Saturday Night Fever. Yes. And then Grease, both of which were fucking massive in 77 and 78. Huge. And Huge. this was kind of not an official trilogy, but the third Robert Stigwood involved movie musical with Sgt. Pepper. And the expectations, Tony, were massive when this thing was being released. Yes. So they had a $13 million budget. And then when the box office came, it it made 20.4 million. So compared that to like, it was like 200 million for, for Greece and Saturday night fever. This, it was a, it was a critical flop and uh, audiences largely ignored it. Well, and I got to know this movie uh, when it was being rerun, you know, back in the day, actually, as we record this, this is, it's on Monday, the, the 19th, the 20th, yes. this, this Monday is last night. We're actually staying with, uh, my mother-in-law and they had 60 minutes on, which I think is a requirement for all mother-in-laws around <laughs> the country, which is great. I'm not complaining. It was fun to watch 60 minutes again. And it no, was it's all, great. Leslie Stahl. Yeah. Le, yeah. Le, Leslie Stahl and the, the Fauci interview, which was uh, both disturbing and enlightening. But at any rate, the TV was on. We had dinner. People were starting to get, to ready, get ready for bed. And Ferris Bueller's Day Off, another movie that utilizes a Beatles song, Twist and Shout, for maybe the, the biggest scene in the film, the parade scene. Um, right. But I, Ferris Bueller's Day Off was on CBS last night, and it was that old school thing of like, oh, yeah, way pre-Netflix and way pre-Hulu. And, and you know, even like in the days when HBO and Showtime were big, but not what they are now, you'd get current or 10, 15, 20-year-old movies on, on the, the Sunday night movie, Tonight, Forrest Gump, somebody who's got you know, like some, some issues with shrimp. That's next on <laughs> CBS. Prepare for a chilling network premiere on the CBS Sunday movie. Shrimp soup, shrimp stew, shrimp salad, shrimp and potatoes, shrimp burger, shrimp salad. Issues with shrimp. <laughs> yeah, that was the byline, the I think, on that. <laughs> also, the ill-fated sequel to Dancing with Wolves was Issues with Shrimp. <laughs> Terrible. Um, so, yeah, but it was interesting, uh, the timing, because before Ferris Bueller was on CBS, it just it felt anachronistic to see. Now, Ferris Bueller's in the mid-'80s. That's more than 10, 15 years ago. But it still yeah. felt weird to see a movie like that on a major network. But because of the pandemic, without networks to have nothing to fucking air— <laughs> um, so, uh, but point being, I rewatched this movie twice. I hadn't seen it in years either. I'd heard the soundtrack fairly recently. It was just one of those vinyl records that a few years ago, I just kind of pulled out and gave another listen to, to see what I remembered from it. But I taped this off channel nine in Chicago, WGN, the late night movie must have been on at like 11 or 11 30 at night in 1987 and all the commercials it's like uh, walter walter payton wearing a bill cosby sweater and the original <laughs> salozy adelson if walter payton doing a thing for mad mothers against drug, drug oh driving. is that what that was oh i love that's it. what that was hi i'm walter payton to see how you can join the fight to get drunk drivers off the road please call mothers against drunk driving We now return to Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And so it was really cool to kind of, you forget how often you'd watch, like, I can tell you where the commercial breaks were in fucking Caddyshack and, <laughs> and in National Boone's Vacation because you used to watch them on the station. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I was familiar with this from when I was like a, a teenager on. I have never, ever hated this movie but I have I'm aware that it's terrible. I weirdly enjoy this movie, but it is it's enjoyable in a way that is god awful. 
Yeah. It's it's absolute horseshit, the entire film. And 98% of the soundtrack is abominable. And it actually, <laughs> we'll get into this, it knocks down two Hall of Famers of Peg in my mind. One in the Beatles' orbit and one of the greatest comedians ever don't get first ballot Hall of Fame because they made this fucking movie. <laughs> <laughs> There. Yeah, man. No, you're right. You're right. Yeah. It's funny in the in the Robert Stigwood RSO organization pantheon, this was probably, ironically, his magical mystery tour. Ah, yes, it was. Right? Sgt. Pepper is his magical mystery tour because it, it didn't do well. If it, it, it was a flop. Um, and so I think we should also say, man, spoilers ahoy. We're doing spoilers. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> You, there's a pause control, you know, you, and you can rent this thing on Amazon. It costs four bucks, whatever, like however you want to see it. I think it's actually on YouTube if you want to, like, see it for free, I think. Who the fuck is upset about spoilers for the Sgt. Pepper film from 78 <laughs> where Peter Frampton, are he and Steven Tyler about to make out? <laughs> when they're, they got a mic stand. There is a lot of they're both wearing silk. sensual yeah, tension. It's, it's very <laughs> sensual yeah. tension. Tony and DJ present tension. Um, favorite Wham album. But, uh, yeah, so let, let's get into this. Before we do, there are a couple things I wanted to point out, Tony, here. That in 1978, the Beatles were still, this is eight years after the breakup, right? They are still so beloved that the musical Beatlemania is taking Broadway and the country by storm in touring productions. We keep talking about Mitch Weissman. One day we're going to get to the goddamn... Um, <laughs> Beatlemania. Joey loves Chachi. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I never said I was Paul McCartney. Well, you look like him. You yeah. talk like him. And when we were at the hospital, we saw you eating an English muffin. Yeah. <laughs> The, he, but Beatlemania was so huge by the late 70s, early 80s that a cast member of a Beatles tribute musical was starring in an ABC uh, guest spot. So the Beatles, right. it was huge. And in fact, this movie, uh, as many other moments in the 70s, and I mentioned Ferris Bueller, when Ferris Bueller came out, Twist and Shout charted as a single. Capital released the 45. And when Ferris Bueller came out, because there was no official soundtrack for that movie, um, Capitol Records started printing on uh, as a hype sticker for the early Beatles vinyl includes Twist and Shout as a way to capitalize on Ferris Bueller. So when Sgt. Pepper came out, they reissued the album, they released a picture disc and a 45 that had Sgt. Pepper and with a little, little help from my friends. This is 11 years later, by the way, after the album, backed with uh, A Day in the Life was released and it wasn't a hit, but it charted. Right. So you had these 11-year-old songs, the original Beatles versions, hitting the charts, which shows you how huge they were even then. So this movie is eight years after the breakup and still at a time when McCartney's on top of the world, Lennon's in retirement, Ringo's recording your favorite album, Bad Boy. Thank you. And George is still kind of trying to find himself on that on the Dark Horse label. But they're huge, so the hype for this movie choreographed by Patricia Birch, who did all the choreography in Greece oh. and went on to direct Greece 2 in 1982, another <laughs> horrible movie that I just fucking love. It's on the Take a hike. Get a but it's, it's a testament. I wanted to bring up how the Beatles as an entity reacted to this by saying, we're going to get on this bandwagon and reissue the Sgt. Pepper album and the single for the first time. It was wild. There were a lot of high hopes riding on this movie, Sgt. Pepper. Um, somebody said it was going to be this generation's Gone with the Wind. <laughs> right? Racist in 2020. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely what they meant. And, uh, <laughs> and then I think you uh, you maybe turned me on. Uh, <laughs> did, did I turn you on, Dead Man? <laughs> you might have turned me on, Dead Man, to this quote that Robin Gibb, one of the Bee Gees, gave before the release and all the hype, he said, There is no such thing as the Beatles now. They don't exist as a band and never perform Sgt. Pepper live in any case. When ours comes out, <laughs> it will be, in effect, as if theirs never existed. <laughs> I almost couldn't get through that without laughing. So good. <laughs> So that's not how that turned out. 
I'm glad you knew that was Robin Gibb because it's just one of the Gibbs. And in the movie, the Gibbs are the closest thing to wolves I've ever seen in my entire <laughs> life. They all look like wolves. <laughs> I can't explain it. There's an eerie, I don't know which, the primary Gibb, the one who. Barry. The, the, the one, yeah, the one who. With the uh, lion's mane, yes. That's Barry Gibb. He's like a lion wolf. And yeah, he, that's Barry. <laughs> not a L Y I N wolf, who is a great blues singer from Mississippi. <laughs> yeah, the gentleman Lion Wolf. Yeah, he opened up for White Jelly Fungus. Great blues. <laughs> you like the blues? <laughs> He's gonna sing Wang Dang Poodle. <laughs> if I had a poodle, I would name it Wang Dang. It'd be my Wang Dang Poodle. Oh my God! There was so much writing on this, and this killed RSO as a label, and Peter Frampton. Peter Frampton was fucking massive. I, I, I don't mind Peter Frampton. Peter yeah. Frampton, that Frampton Comes Alive album yeah. is a real, it's it's a cool album, and it's a cool kind of relic of its time. Plus, I saw him on the road with Ringo in 95. He's a diehard Beatles fan who sang Norwegian Wood solo on the 95 tour, which was a, uh, with Ringo's All-Star Band, which was really cool. I once had a girl, or should I say, she once had me. She showed me her room, isn't it good, Norwegian wood. She asked me to stay. We got to get into it, but I want to say that RSO, that record label, was maybe the first record label I ever remember because it had the little pig on it, mm-hmm. right? It's a piggy bank, right? Is it a cow? Whatever it is, I, yes. I, oh, I, man. Was a, I was the RSO was a cow because all the solo Clapton albums are on RSO as well. Right, right. Yeah, he's like the Elmer on Elmer's Glue. It's like, what is that? What is that? <laughs> what is that thing? Is that Jesse Plemons or whatever? <laughs> Former Bulls coach Jim Clemens. And now. <laughs> I like Jesse Clemens. I think that's how you say his name. <laughs> but I always thought, oh, he looks like the Elmer's glue thing. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to discern, but it's either a cow or a pig or, or a pig cow or a bull. Yeah. That they spoof in the movie, BD Records, which yes. is loaded. This movie's loaded with the dumbest inside jokes. Yeah. The, the first thing you see on screen is... Uh, they show the f- First World War, and it's the tiny village of Flou de Coupe in French. Pretty it's good. the first joke in the film. Pretty good. And you know, and you got it <laughs> two hours and 12 minutes after that to go. <laughs> but yeah, so the RSO label, I'm with you. I loved it too. I've told you on the show, the Grease soundtrack is the first album I ever love, loved. And to this day, I've got a weird nostalgia for it. And the RSO records, the Grease soundtrack, this album to an extent, if it wasn't such horse shit, um, a lot of the Clapton solo stuff like Slow Hand, RSO mastered their albums with such warmth back in the day. I can't explain it, but they captured drums and bass so well in the mid 70s it's one of the reasons a lot of people dog on solo clapton i'm not one i love solo clapton i can see where people think that what he started doing with yardbirds and cream and Derek and the dominoes he kind of became a little pop pappy hey it's america's favorite kids character poppy <laughs> pappy <laughs> like <Bye>. kids <laughs> for your love <laughs> for your love <laughs> anyone for tennis an obscure cream yeah, I know that cream song yeah thank you it's a, it's a great tune anyone for tennis wouldn't that be nice but the album Slow Hand which has Lay Down Sally on it and Cocaine and a few other tracks it's just that's an RSO and it's so well mastered and recorded. So RSO was not a waste of a label. They had some of the biggest hits of the 70s on that label. And then poof, gone. I yeah. think absorbed by the Polydor family of labels. The uh, in kindergarten for show and tell, I brought in the Shadow Dancing 45. The song of the moment. I loved that song. I don't know why. <laughs> well, you were in kindergarten. You're allowed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but I, I think I liked the little animal on the record label, and I liked that song. I still don't know why. There's no hook. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's like a really dull song, but I liked it. It's better than uh, your mining disaster 1941. At least a... <laughs> so it starts off with the war. Basically, it starts off. We're doing spoilers here. It starts off with like the history of Sergeant Pepper, and it's these old guys, and then one of them like gets a heart attack. Oh well. And George Burns is narrating the whole thing. He's the only guy that has spoken dialogue in the entire movie. The rest of it is all musical numbers, right? Well, if, if I may, there's a couple of Frankie Howard ad lib <laughs> ad lib spoken lines. Beautiful, sweet. There's a few. It's like You're a right. video game where you hear Forgot. that weird voice. Forgot. Forgot. And Steve Martin is technically singing or talking, you know. She tells Max to stay when the class has gone away. Oh, it was We'll get to him, whatever yeah, the fuck he and Alice Cooper did in this thing. <laughs> we we have, like, we have strap in folks. If you thought the Lennon one was long, this is a nine part. <laughs> this is the last dance of Beatles podcast of the Sergeant Pepper film. Yeah, no. well, Steve Cohen's going to be on in a minute to talk about this too. <laughs> So, yes, it starts off the First World War and Sergeant Pepper, the, the band, has been entertaining Heartland, of which Thank George you. Burns is the mayor for generations. And then shit goes down. Right. And it should be noted, George Burns's character is named Mr. Kite because we all have our little beetle. This is a pet peeve of mine with any like across the universe or even yesterday or whatever. Like there's all these little beetle like nods. It even annoys me at a goddamn McCartney concert when they're doing Eleanor Rigby and that they go to this, the line about like darning his socks in the night and they, they fucking pan down to the keyboard player and he's just wearing socks or something. I'm like, fuck you guys. But I, I, I don't like the little cutesy, like, stra- like there's a character in here named Strawberry Fields. There's a character in here named Lucy in the Sky or whatever, you know, like that stuff makes me want to throw up. But um, but yeah, so George Burns is Mr. Kite. And um, he sings yeah. a line in the middle of the movie of Benefit of Mr. Kite. But early, he's got one of the very first numbers where he sings uh, Fixing a Hole as a Soft Shoe Number with two children <laughs> Who may have been kidnapped? <laughs> it is one of my favorite. Uh, it's one of my favorite parts of the movie for sure. <laughs> yeah, me too. Is and this is like the second song. Like I think they they open up with Sergeant Pepper proper the song. Yeah, and it's introduced that Billy Shears, right? Billy Shears from the song, you know, with a little help from my friends, uh, is Peter Frampton's character. What would you think if I sang out of tune? Would you stand up and walk out on me? And the Bee Gees are the Hendersons, right? From uh-huh. Mr. Kai. The Hendersons would all be there, unfortunately. <laughs> Pack of wolves. <laughs> yeah, and their names are Mark, Dave, and Bob, <laughs> if you believe that. <laughs> the Hendersons. Yeah, and they're all very wooly. Yeah, they look like wolves. That's the perfect description. Uh, especially Barry. He's got the best hair in the movie. His hair was perfect. Uh, followed by his brother, Robin, who he's the strange looking one. And then there's Morris. Their younger brother, Lepo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they're, they're yeah. all just, they're, and they are some of the worst actors you've ever, we well. just watched the Ruddles where you, <laughs> where you saw Mick Jagger improvising. David Bowie improvises a bit in the second one. Bonnie Raitt, James Taylor. We've seen professional actors improvise and be funny. The Bee Gees and Peter Frampton pull off some of the, and oh, Fuck it, Sandy Farina as Strawberry. <laughs> it is one of the best things about this movie is it has some of the worst acting ever committed to film. And yeah. uh, at least Frampton and uh, and uh, 
I just said her name and I can't remember. Sandy Farina. Strawberry Field. Sandy Farina later uh, later started a big oatmeal company. Is that what Farina was? Uh, yeah, her and Dennis no got together and made that. <laughs> they hijacked a little boy to be <laughs> at a photo shoot going, oh, making a Home Alone face on the box. You're never too young. And you're never too old. To enjoy delicious, nutritious H.O. Cream Farina. Like Wilhelmina, you love Farina. H.O. Farina, cream, Farina, smooth and delicious. And that little boy was later singing with George Burns going, <laughs> la, 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 la. That is the best part. Yeah, there's a two shot of the girls just like staring up at George Burns going, wah, wah. It's and creepy. it ends with George Burns going, a one, a two. Yeah, he starts throwing numbers in there. It stops my mind from wandering. Where? Where? It will. When's Gracie showing up? George, go back to your trailer for a few minutes. (laughs) And this is pre-Oh God, so there was redemption for George Burns after this. I think it's pre-Oh God. Uh, You know, I don't remember. Everything's around this same time. People were fucking busy in the 70s, man. Yeah. Like, Sgt. Pepper came out in July of 78. Grease came out in June of 78. Like they're on top of each other with these. Well, it's it's a lesson, and I've never done it. I'm not an advocate of it, but you know, maybe cocaine works. And for all you kids listening to this podcast, I just want you to say all we are saying is give coke a chance. Uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've never done it. I I, I won't. I, I, I've no, you died. did it like, one like, time I, accidentally. Remember, you was, said it, it on was, this podcast. It was put in a bowl <laughs> when I was at a random party with Horatio Sands and Matt Dwyer. <laughs> And it was referred to as coke weed. But when I say I've never done it, like I've never intentionally snorted cocaine. I did got smoke it, in a bowl where Horatio Sands was trying to tell me I wasn't going to die. It's kind <laughs> of an interesting night. But you know what I'm saying. I do know what you're saying. And I do think if we're talking about these kinds of things, I do think that being you know, in an altered state helps this movie out a lot. Uh-huh. Um, you don't need it, but it helps. It helps get through this. It's. I think it's about two hours, yeah? I think two hours plus. This might clock in at a 2.12. Uh, just enough for after an hour 50, my wife was like, are you still watching that? I'm like, yes. <laughs> and spoilers, uh, Frampton's about to jump off a roof. And, uh, oh, spoilers, <laughs> Frampton and Steven Tyler are having a homoerotic fight. <laughs> wearing silk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so this so the, what is the premise of this movie? Let's I know how far are we in? 25 it, it, minutes it, in. The premise is, is it's the, a dumb it, it's it's a bad second city review from 1983. 83. Where it's a loose collection of bullshit that nobody had the balls to say cut it. <laughs> cut edit cut it. Cut it. As far as I can tell, the point of this movie is that um mean Mr. Mustard who is the villain he drives around in a big giant truck that resembles um if you've ever seen the movie The Warriors it looks like the bus that the Turnbull ACs are ch- chasing the warriors <laughs> Turnbull ACs I think they forgot about the truce No shit <laughs> and with that one guy swinging the <laughs> the plank of wood <laughs> he gets a nice one single <laughs> close up um so it's me, Mr. Mustard lives in this fucked up bus that's, you know, mustard colored and dilapidated looking. But inside it are these female robots with <laughs> circuitry hair and they have like, you know, the phone dial pad on their breasts or whatever. And <laughs> I don't know what they are, but they speak in that Frampton vocoder thing, which is great. Uh-huh. And it's the Bee Gees doing all their all their vocals. Yeah. The best the Bee Gees sound in the whole film. <laughs> yeah, so mean old man. Such a mean old man. I agree, a mean old man. Excellent. 
So, yeah, and that's the premise is that Mean Mr. Mustard is out there stealing the instruments, which is it's kind of like the Yellow Submarine cartoon uh, premise, yeah. kind of right, where they're stealing the Sergeant Pepper's gear. And then so the goal is that the Bee Gees have to, you know, get those instruments so that they can, you know, play whatever. The, the closing number. So they can save Heartland because what Mean Mr. Mustard does is when the Sgt. Pepper Band, a.k.a. the Bee Gees and Frampton, make it big, they go to California for a scene that has made me, honest to God, that and the spaghetti scene for Magical Mystery Tour are the two of the biggest nightmares I've ever had in my life as a kid. Uh, because the scene where uh, they're doing one of the worst songs in the movie, and there are an inordinate number of worst songs in the movie, my list says, no, this one's worse. <laughs> no, this one's worse. We'll, we'll get to it. But is this I want you. Doing, I, this is I want you. She's yeah. so heavy, and like a nine-minute yeah. version of it, never-ending version of it. They're just drinking drinks with pills, and it's like vaguely porn. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, homoerotica and heteroerotica abound. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I love there's like a, a panning shot across the arcade and there's a couple on the camera left where you're like, what are they doing? They just look like they're like jitterbugging, but it's supposed to be erotic. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, in the 70s, you made love with the jitterbugs. You brought back the old days. That was the original, Margo. <laughs> they called it the jitterbug. <laughs> yes! 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 I'll have what she's having. Let's do it. Yeah, it should be noted that this movie is visually... It is visually over the top. It's it's like yeah. those. It's like Grease, but it, uh, like uh, it should be said, Robert Stigwood also did Tommy. So if you've ever yes. seen Tommy, like the over the top, colorful, giant casts, giant long takes, choreographed with all these like visual explosions, not real explosions, Die Hard or whatever. This is like clowns and jugglers and face paint mimes and like fucked up nightmare shit <laughs> you know and uh it's so it's visually very fun but it is like okay what what is going on here um and that long sequence when they're playing i want you she's so heavy this very light version of this the w- arguably one of the beatles heavyest songs it's mm-hmm. like this <laughs> air conditioned version of that song yeah, it goes on forever. That's all. And and they're in limos and there's drugs and orgies. And basically they kind of sign their their life away to this record company, Big Deal Records, which is a play on RSO, which is basically Satan. And then meanwhile, their hometown of Heartland goes to hell or something. Right. Not only does the and you mentioned the video arcade, not only does the hometown go to hell and they open a video arcade in Heartland, but also for no reason a giant cheeseburger hangs in the center of the gazebo. <laughs> oh, yeah. For reasons I never now uh, look, I, I love a good burger. And burgers in the seventies where people gave a fuck about like weight and all that. Burgers, seventies burgers were great. May I help you, sir? Two whoppers, two whopper juniors, and four Coca-Cola. And would I have to wait long if you made one whopper with no pickle and no lettuce? No, sir. Sure. Hold the pickle, hold the lettuce, special orders don't upset us, all we ask is... Ah! Diabetes. That's why I started eating burgers. But why is it in the center of Heartland? What does it signify? I, I, I actually know the answer to this, TJ. So that's not really? yeah, okay. that's not cheese. That's mustard. Oh, that's me, Mr. Mustard. It sleeps in the park. Yes. Okay. Oh, there you go. Okay. okay yeah. We're, oh, oh but this, actually, you know what? This movie's good. <laughs> the more I think about it, I'll take it. It's my generation's Forrest Gump. Shrimp kebabs, shrimp creole. Gumbo. Uh, but yeah, so it's uh, so the whole town goes to hell, and because the Sergeant Pepper band has made it big, we also forgot to mention that Billy Shears' uh, stepbrother is Dougie Shears, who's apparently an asshole. He becomes the manager. Right. He's vaguely rapey. He's just he he's big. You know, I kept thinking uh, Dougie Shears is Don Junior or Eric. <laughs> Dougie Shears is basically one of the two Trump boys. No, you, like, yeah, yeah. You you don't trust him with your sister or your friend. It's it's the same actor who played cousin Kevin in Tommy. Yes, we're on our own, cousin. All alone, cousin. Let's think of a game to play. Now the grown-ups have all gone away. Oh, there's a hot air balloon. That's fun. A few times. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. 
<laughs> it's big and you know rainbow colored. It gets hit by a jet, and then that's how the that's how the Bee Gees get to L.A. <laughs> Love the major seven ending of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so there's all kinds of weird stuff happens in this movie, but at any rate, we should kind of be talking about some of the songs here. And one of the most offensive ones to me, and I know you mentioned last week, I think it is your favorite Beatles single. What Sandy Farina and George Martin do to Strawberry Fields is unforgivable. It's like they said, how do we do a Helen Reddy song but make it sleepier? Let me take you down, cause I'm going to Strawberry Fields. Nothing is real, and nothing to get hung about. So this is, I'm just going to throw this out here right now. We don't have to dwell on this for too long. George Martin is definitively the fifth Beatle. God bless you, Murray the K, and God bless you, Brian Epstein. Stuart Sutcliffe. Pete, Stuart Sutcliffe. Pete Best was an original Beatle. All that stuff. Uh, Andy White, you know. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. The, who, who's, who's the dude Jimmy who played when Ringo was a Jimmy Nickel, right? <laughs> they never let talk. Jimmy, smile for a second. Um, but <laughs> that scowl Lennon gives Jimmy Nickel when Jimmy Nickel actually says one <laughs> sentence is amazing. <laughs> so as far as Ringo, I can never, um, I can never make up for what Ringo is. You know, come on, you constantly <laughs> know your role. Is the gentleman saying? But George Martin to me is the fifth Beatles. So much of. He found a way, like a great. He's almost like uh, in in improv parlance, he's like Mick or what Bernie was back in the day, right? He just found a way to to augment this already incredible generational talent and complement without having to get in the way. You know what I'm saying? He's uh, to, to me, George Martin, his yes and approach. His steady hand, his professionalism, his acceptance, and his sense of fucking taste. Uh, Yesterday or Eleanor Rigby, in anyone else's hands, uh, these songs are schmaltz and they're schlocky. And yes, that's the Beatles, but it's also the way they were produced, those string arrangements. So what George Martin did producing the music for this film, Tony is unforgivable and he's still the fifth Beatle but this <laughs> this movie knocks the brilliant George Martin down a peg for me little darling it's been a long cold lonely winter little darling it feels like years since it's been here here comes the sun here comes the sun <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, this, yeah, when you earlier in the podcast said that you had listened to this album recently, that was very surprising to me, because I think I bought it, I bought it, you know, used, cut out style, like you said, for fun, and I I maybe have listened to it once, you know, and that was like, you know, 20 years ago. It was 20 years ago today! So, like, to listen to these songs on purpose to me is... It seems like a strange exercise. Every once in a while, I pull out an album that I've that I've never wanted to get rid of and haven't heard in 15, 20 years and kind of give it a spin. And I did that with this one maybe four or five. I mean, recently, not like two weeks ago, but probably four or five years ago, I brought it out for a spin for the first time in a while. And it's terrible. Now, we'll get to this as we go. It featured the soundtrack's got 177 songs on it. And I think there's <laughs> three are great it's like three are great and the rest you don't ever need to hear again is my humble assessment but we'll get to them as they come strawberry fields by sandy farina with george martin's you know how do we make linda rodstadt more boring arrangement is very (laughs) unnerving to me and also okay so this woman strawberry Fields, she looks i thought she was like 28 it turns out i think she was 23 when it was filmed but um, yeah, it's so strange because she's in this bedroom singing Strawberry Fields and it's like, you know, she's got like teenage posters on the wall and there's a teddy bear and it's just like, what's going on with you? <laughs> you know, you're like... <laughs> 
but do you, hey, yeah, you need some help? <laughs> it's like, well, it's like they were trying to kind of also make her Sandy from Greece, but it didn't make any sense. And that's what it is. It's not for, excuse me for insulting Helen Reddy and Linda Ronstadt. They were kind of trying to make her like Olivia Newton John. Yeah, yeah, right. Also, you keep mentioning Helen Reddy. Helen Reddy's in this at the end, uh, oh, in the well, big gaggle of people at the end. We'll have 45 minutes to talk about <laughs> what Helen Reddy, Jackie Lomax, and Carol Channing are doing together. <laughs> that ending, it's some of the, especially if you're of a certain age, the ending of this film, the last three minutes is a must watch for. Like, if you're, say, 45 or older, <laughs> You'll really get it. If you're younger, you'll go, I'm so glad I did not live in the 70s. <laughs> yeah, it really is a who's who. <laughs> oh, oh, look, it's Jocko from Shut <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, man. Shut up. Yeah. Yip, 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 yip. There were a lot of people where I'm like, wait. Who is that? It really was like, <laughs> who are you? I know I saw you once somewhere, you know. <laughs> oh, oh, shit. Gwen Verdon's still alive. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so the music is it's rough, man. It's rough. I, I was going to say they do a, a version of She's Leaving Home where they have the, the vocoder robot voices going on. And I was wondering if that helped it for you, TJ, it being one of your least favorite songs. <laughs> Tony, you know I'm a musical theater guy, but when they hear her parents go, how could she do this to me? Like it's, uh, like it's the all-amateur production of Carousel at the prison. <laughs> It's like George Martin's revenge for Paul not, <laughs> not letting him orchestrate it. There you go. There you go. It you did it. Just <laughs> terrible. <laughs> I did read that George Martin uh, regretted producing the music. I did read that that George regretted it, which he gets some some points for. But maybe that's why he didn't do Free as a Bird and Real Love. It wasn't his hearing. The Beatles were like, hey, George, we saw what you did with the Sgt. Pepper movie. Right. Bye-bye. Or Let's... maybe he was scared. Maybe he was like, no, you know, fool me once kind of a thing. <laughs> no, I'll get this uh, guy with hair and sunglasses to do it for you. <laughs> I know a guy. <laughs> I know a guy. George does too. <laughs> It goes back to Robert Stigwood buying these songs for a prior project in the early 70s. Uh, and I, I, I did a, a stage play and I know probably stage play. Yeah. Something called like World War Two and the Beatles or something like that. I know I'm getting the title wrong. Uh, and that, I understand, was also a film that has only been shown like once. I think they played it at the Music Box in Chicago. It's this it's this weird. I guess it's even worse than this movie. It's. It's the Beatles' Song of the South. <laughs> or the day the clown died. Yeah, Southern songs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, that's basically the movie. That's them driving around, you know, being tempted by the rock star life while their hometown goes to shit and turns into, you know, a Trump casino, basically. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's, it's Biff before Biff, Trump before Trump. And, um, yeah, with, like you said, these, these songs thrown in there kind of making sense, also not making sense. Uh, you've got the Bee Gees singing Get Back. Uh, Robin Gibb does a version of Oh Darling. Um, I forget her name because she didn't work again after this, but she does Lucy in the Sky with the woman that plays Lucy in the Sky, which is like the, you know, the, the apple or whatever, the temptation for Peter Frampton. You know, Billy Shears is in love with Strawberry Fields, but once he gets famous, him and Lucy might have a thing. Isn't that what's going on? I I, I don't know because there weren't enough drugs to really figure that out. <laughs> so uh, Nowhere Man by the Bee Gees is another one on my list of a song that is an atrocity. <laughs> He's a real nowhere man sitting in his nowhere land making all 
I agree with you. That version, I wrote down FM light version of Nowhere Man. It's, yeah, they, they do a halftime on the drums. It's very sleepy. It's very, yeah, it's very, um, what's that? What's the slow song on Saturday Night Fever? I love that. How deep is your love? You, you look like a wolf when you sing that. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Lycanthropy, man. <laughs> You know, there's an A flat minor six in that song, and that to me is the chord that. Thank you. That's the chord that makes it for me. <laughs> me and John were just playing different chords, and then we started playing uh, "How Deep Is Your Love," and we hit that chord. And went, that's the chord. Words. I don't do Beatles. Everyone thinks about the Beatles for something I can imitate them. I can't. I can do just dumb Liverpool guy. Sure. You know, it's like this, and you kind of do a bit, and you talk a bit like this, and you do a bit. Yeah, one time I was going. Yeah, I was doing my thing, going like Wookly Wookly, right? Jones, they going Scooby Doo, 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 Doo. You could be on the Beatles cartoons, the the reboot. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that version of Nowhere Man is terrible. Um, when they do Good Morning, Good Morning, that's where the movie then becomes a commercial for itself. They recorded printing the soundtrack covers. Yeah. They, they made it into the movie. They got this like stock. <laughs> yeah. The, the famous factory footage of them <laughs> manufacturing the soundtrack album for the movie you're watching. Then suddenly everyone's wearing T-shirts with the movie logo <laughs> on them. Like. It's beautiful. It's like fourth wall. It's breaking the fourth wall with a big middle finger, man. Anytime the band is doing a faux live performance, it's the Sgt. Pepper Beatles band wearing the Sgt. Pepper costumes. And then it's a bunch of back musicians playing bongos and Moog synthesizers in yeah. T-shirts that just have the movie logo on it. I'm so yeah. glad you called it out. It's so ridiculous. I love it. I mean, that is so on a unapologetically it's genius actually i i love it i love it <laughs> it's actually my it's actually a compliment to me for the film that just like all right we're going to be a commercial for this it's like in space balls when they <laughs> when they start selling space balls merch during the fucking movie what a great fit brilliant maybe the most underrated of the, the mel brooks films by the way and i do not include yeah. robin hood men in tights which was not funny in 90 uh. and still not funny Saw it in the theater. I did too. <laughs> I, I was. I remember being disappointed at like fifteen or sixteen. I was like, "Mel, what are you doing?" Um, so yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. It's uh, one cool thing about this. And you sold your soul to move to California. You're Mr. LA now. You root Thank for you. you root for the Dodgers. You love Kenley Jansen. It's the whole thing. They're in the World Series. They are. I just found out this morning. <laughs> um, there was an incredible game seven last night, and I just heard about it. I, I didn't watch it. I. I did I? I did not. But uh, I, they'll find a way to get their hearts broken again in the World Series by uh, Tampa. Yeah, like they did two years ago. Yeah. So, all right, that's baseball talk. <laughs> Where were we? Well, we're just going through. Let's. Let, you want to talk about Alice Cooper, or do you want to talk about Steve Martin? <laughs> Which Steve Martin came first? Uh, Steve Martin. By the time this movie was being made, Tony. Steve Martin uh, was uh, his album and the King Tut single, that wild and crazy guy record, was like the biggest sure. comedy selling album of all time. Steve Martin was already on the path to being uh, a Hall of Famer. His, Pardon me. His, uh, well, excuse, I, was it, excuse, excuse me. me. <laughs> I excuse were, me. I uh, fucked it also up. Also, Tony farted before he said that. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Steve Martin as uh, uh, Dr. Maxwell. Of course, excuse me. So Maxwell Silver Hammer. So Steve Martin as Dr. Maxwell, who gets Maxwell Silver Hammer, is notable for a lot of reasons. One, it is among the worst comedic performances from a comedy genius ever put on film. It is so overdone and so ham-fisted, so terribly produced. George Martin drops the sound effect in about nine times. Nine <laughs> times. He keeps dropping it in. It's once in the, on the original. Bang, bang, Maxwell Silver Hammer came down upon her head. Bang, bang, Maxwell Silver Hammer made sure she was dead. Oh, oh, oh. And 
What's so fascinating is Steve Martin was terrible, terrible seeing a Maxwell Silverhammer with some of the worst, weirdest choreography. The actors doing the backup dancing uh, were clearly given thalidomide before shooting this because <laughs> something is just wrong. And something's out of control. But with the craziest thing, Tony, the craziest thing, how bad Steve Martin is in this film, both singing and acting, is nine years later, he had the same role yeah. in the incredible movie Little Shop of Horrors right. where he sang Dentist and was brilliant. I am your dentist and I enjoy the career that I think I am your dentist and I get off on the pain I am and what Frank Oz, they, this movie needed Frank Oz to direct it, apparently, because Steve Martin, in a similar role with a similar novelty song, demolishes it in Little Shop of Horrors. And in this, I think it is an atrocity on comedy that drops Steve Martin down one notch in the Comedy Hall of Fame. Well, excuse me! Yeah, man, it's way over the top. <laughs> it's... I mean, here's what I'll give him. I'm going to give him this, all right? He is a pro at whatever the fuck he's doing in this. He is a pro. He knows exactly, like, I think he's having trouble with his glove during the whole, he's got these rubber gloves, and, like, it it got put on all funny by one of the singers, uh, dancers, and so he's, like, while he's doing all his other shtick, he's trying to fix this goddamn glove on his left hand or whatever, and then, uh, (laughs) but there's a lot of prop work, There's, there's a lot going on, and it He's definitely a pro. You can you can see that he is trying to make this the best <laughs> it can be by maybe going over the top. Um, and then I also love how it just kind of it turns into this disco s- sword fight <laughs> at the end with like electronic. You know, 70s special effects, you know. <laughs> My note is Maxwell Silverhammer disco dance fight. There you go. Yeah. It's a disco fucking fight. Uh, if, if, if your fetish is watching Peter Frampton and Steve Martin fight, you rent this movie. <laughs> And can I say this? We were talking about the Bee Gees having, you know, these perfectly sculpted manes of hair, even the bald one, (laughs) Morris. (laughs) 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 Poor Peter Frampton's hair through this whole movie. Was it just like humid in L.A. the whole time? (laughs) Like his his hair. Talk about mop top. He's like a real mop. (laughs) Totally. I felt so bad. It's the only hair bit. There's a recurring Frankie Howard wig bit. As mean Mr. Mustard that keeps coming where he's futzing with his wig and he shakes the wig a couple times. Yeah, this Peter Frampton does not come off well as an actor. He looks like a lost little boy who never knew his parents and he's just trying to make it. Yeah, well, he's, it's the whole Robert Stigwood thing of like, well, I made Roger Daltrey from The Who. I turned him into an actor. Right. And, you know, like – it was the seventies. People thought they could do anything. Everybody's a star. Oh yeah. I'm an actor. You know, it was this, <laughs> Right. I don't think Peter Frampton ever wanted to be an actor. I'm pretty sure the Bee Gees never wanted to be actors, but here they are. And they, Bee Gees were, weren't just a seminal part of Saturday Night Fever. They wrote the song Grease for Frankie Valli to sing. The Bee Gees got, oh, I didn't know that. And Peter Frampton played the guitar solo on that. That's kind of how this all came came together. Peter Frampton played lead guitar on the on the song Grease, which is just a massive, massive hit. I know what I wanted to say earlier. You're such an L.A. guy. Uh, this looks like very L.A. in the 70s. I love seeing Tower Records. I think that's the one on the, yeah, on the Tower street. Records. That made me very, very happy. On Sunset, yeah. Yeah, it was cool. I was like, oh, there's Sunset. What was going on on Sunset Boulevard, you know, in 77? I think they were filming in 77. October is what I read. Uh, yeah, so that was cool. It's cool to see that. I also like how the bus drops off Strawberry Fields on Sunset, and then they do the entire number of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, like four minutes or whatever, and then and then the bus then the bus leaves. <laughs> well, the bus is what, buddy. They're doing it on billboards. When you've got a musical number on billboards. <laughs> Yeah, two competing billboards. And by the way, <laughs> Lucy in the Sky, her band, 
uses the Doors font. Yeah, you're, you're totally right. <laughs> Welcome to Font Lover's Corner. <laughs> and the Sgt. Pepper has the Sgt. Pepper commercial on the billboard, I think. I think it's another advertisement. It's got to, yeah. Yeah. List the five ninety nine for the LP. <laughs> Order yours now. Right, with a little cut in it. One ninety nine. Okay. Yeah. Cool. yeah, a little X goes over the five. <laughs> they're, they're giving the eight track away for free at Coconuts. It's nineteen eighty. What, what am I gonna do with this eight track? I have this on eight track, by the way. It's part of my collection. It's not open. I, I really? have a see. I don't mean to brag. I have a sealed copy of the soundtrack on eight track. <laughs> <laughs> that poor eight track is still trapped in that <laughs> shrink wrap. Maybe when I open it, it'll that'll solve the world's problems and make this movie better. Dude, Drunk Lost yeah, by man. a Ton and the Sgt. Pepper movie is great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Big Daddy's Records, formerly on Diversity, just east of Clark Street. <laughs> So, all right. So Steve Martin, he lays an egg in the movie and then it's embarrassing. Then we then we have Alice Cooper uh, doing his thing. He's uh, the the sun king. He he is. Right? He's he's a swindler who runs. He kind of, I think he works for Aerosmith, the FVM. What's the name of that band? But it's we hate. Love, we hate yeah. joy, we love money is their big slogan, which again is the Trump campaign platform. Every time I watch it, I'm like, yeah, I hate joy, I hate love, love money. Trump 2020. Yeah. Um, yeah. Alice Cooper is in a room. It looks very much like Pink Floyd The Wall. It's a classroom where he's brainwashing, you know, all these kids in a very dark room and they're watching uh, – they're watching his performance of the strangest choice <laughs> because off of Which Abbey Road. Like he doesn't sing. Nope. He just kind of growls. Yeah, it. he creepy growls it. Yeah. <laughs> because the world is round. Uh, you know, like <laughs> love is old, love is new. Love is tall, love is you. And the Grammy for Best Impersonation of Wolfman Jack in, in, in a crazy deluded state goes to. By the way, Wolfman Jack is also in this movie <laughs> at the end. <laughs> he totally is. I had my whole bad body dipped in lukewarm clear seal. I mean, it's, it's almost the perfect 70s movie, uh, yeah, by default. And uh, yeah, so I swear to God, Carol Channing thinks she's performing the act one closer of Hello, Dolly in the finale of this. <laughs> Nobody knows the words. If you look there, no, nobody's really singing the words correctly. No, no. But yeah, Alice Cooper is the sandwich eating, you know, br- brainwash manager. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he's that's that. I think that's probably all we have to say. At, at, at this point in the movie, I did write down, how much did this movie cost? Uh, totally. <laughs> what a huge budget. Well, because they were rolling in the money from, I mean, RSO, we talked about, was huge. Saturday Night Fever in yeah. Greece were not just two of the biggest movies ever. Those soundtracks dominated the charts. That's back, you know, before, I think people forget how much album sales used to matter. And you were selling millions of copies over the course of several years. These albums didn't leave the charts. Yeah. Yeah, man. There's a moment in that Alice Cooper thing at the end where there's this, like, ear-piercing feedback, and it goes on for, like, 45 seconds. <laughs> and screaming. And screaming. A lot of screaming in this movie. <laughs> yeah. They have that, like, oh, do we, do we really need that? But it reminds me, I mean, that's how movies used to be. If you watch an old episode of Emergency, one of my favorite things is, like, you'll see the guy get into the ambulance and turn it on, and then he drives the ambulance... And the ambulance is going down <laughs> and down. And then you see it make a right turn. And then it goes out of frame. And then you get a few more seconds of the landscape with nothing in it. And that's an episode of Emergency. <laughs> <laughs> like, there you go. Half of it is watching cars <laughs> just kind of drive. <laughs> oh. We had more time back then. They did have more. Well, you had, you had more air time to fill. <laughs> yeah, but this movie didn't need to be two twelve. They probably could have done with uh, one minute less of the piercing feedback and screaming. <laughs> screaming. And the next big <laughs> musical number. Here's my notes. Uh, Sandy Farina's Strawberry Fields is the worst cover in Beatles history. No, it's the Bee Gees benefit of Mr. Kite. Literal horse. <laughs> oh. 
This is one of the worst moments in the history of film. <laughs> yeah, this is the bit with the tumblers, the clowns, there's trampoline bits. I mean, this is a big number. And they're dry. This is when they're on the on the truck, right? Yeah, this is where they come riding in on the truck. It is the it, it is the literal first draft of Cirque du Soleil's Love. It's what this scene is. It's a proof of concept for Guy Libertier. My favorite is you know the two person horse costume, <laughs> but they're on roller skates. Like <laughs> that is pretty amazing. <laughs> the two person horse costume on roller skates is. I think actually one of the better parts of this movie. Uh, I mean, it it doesn't not work. I mean, it, it, it works in its own. And George Burns gets one solo line in this too. Yeah. George Burns gets to sing a line. I forget which the line was because I think I was already drunk by that point of rewatching this. And Mr. H will demonstrate and Somerset's he'll undertake on solid ground. So Patricia Birch, who gave Grease incredible choreography, so much so that they let her direct all of Grease 2, which was ballsy at the time to have a woman in the early 80s directing a massive movie out of Paramount was was a big deal. Um, yeah. Her choreography for this, it's like we go together on heroin. If you watch <laughs> we go together in some of the weird and the close-up shots of the, the dancing and the movement, there's one, I don't want to lose this, there's one particular moment in the chorus of Maxwell Silver Hammer where kind of the Nazi people that he operates on are doing these leg kicks that is one of the strangest things I've ever seen in film. I mean, I'm, I'm not like a movie nerd. I've seen a lot of movies but I'm not like the movie nerd guy. Right. I dare you to find choreography as weird as the the, the Nazis <laughs> with the ties and Maxwell Silver Hammer. <laughs> this is another one where it's like kind of circusy and kind of druggy, and there's a horse. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a nightmare. Yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, and the orchestration is terrible. Oh, George Martin's orchestration, working with John Lennon with the backwards tape loops and all the cool shit in Sergeant Pepper, is gone. Here it's just. Garbage. Yeah. It's garbage. And of course, Henry the horse dances the walls. And yeah. I like the Bee Gees. I actually do like the Bee Gees. I like their '60s stuff, and I I love that Saturday Night Fever. I do. I, it's it. I would rank it I as, as one too. of the best uh, soundtrack albums ever. That Curtis Mayfield Superfly. There's got to be another one, but those are my two favorite soundtrack albums. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. But there's something about their voices with this music that like doesn't work. I don't know what it is. It should work, but it it doesn't. I don't think their hearts are into it, Tony. I mean, I, I actually, it sounds like they're never communicating with the songs. Nobody in this movie except Steve Martin for the wrong reasons. No way. No, no. Frankie Howard doing When I'm 64 is very, very strange. Now, when I get older, losing my hair many years from now. But... The BG stuff doesn't work because they're never connecting with the lyrics. I know you're more music than lyrics, but even you must watch this and realize there's no, there's nothing symbiotic about the words coming out of their mouth and the meaning coming out of their hearts. Well, you know, what's funny though, man, is that in a day in the life, when Barry Gibb gets his solo shot with that song, he is trying so hard to insert emotion like this soap opera version of emotion into these completely detached lyrics about like reading the paper and oh this guy died huh that's too bad the english army <laughs> had just won the, it's the and, and and robin gibb and the and aleppo gibb are just kind of nodding their heads in weird agreement it's so weird aleppo <laughs> <laughs> whatever the fucking third movie is. yeah it's morris but i I, I love <laughs> not Maurice Morris. I love Lepo though. Uh, yeah, that would be the one time where he's trying to like make this song make sense. But it's like those lyrics have nothing to do with like you know it has like what is that anyway? I, I just love that a day in the life was happening during this movie, and he's trying to have it make sense with this story. It it's not the English Army <laughs> the Lancashire. Have nothing to do with anything. <laughs> so stupid. And though the hoes are rather strawberry's dead, 
They had to count them all. What is it? Oh, yeah, that's Anything. right. Strawberry Fields dies. Woke up, fell out of bed, drank the coat across my head. Found my way downstairs and drank a cup. That's another one where, where, where George Martin's orchestration is pitiful for Day in the Life. George Martin is one of the best producers in the history of music. I'll never forgive him for this. There's two songs in a row back to back in the plot. One of them, I think, is the most unfortunate number in the film, and it's You Never Give Me Your Money. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All good children go to heaven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All good children go to heaven. One, two, three, With the, the star guard or whatever the hell the woman is who's, who plays Lucy. Yeah. And uh, I love favorite Bowie song, Star Guard. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, and uh, who's is that? Paul Williams. Who, uh, who's who's doing the uh, the part of Dougie? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I think that's his name. Uh, yeah, that is so awful. It looks like a like a like seventies under rehearsed porn. <laughs> The acting, there's no sex in it. Just you know what I mean. The acting is just atrocious, and all the cash and yeah. And she starts it so high in her register, like <laughs> you never give me. I'm like whoa. Your money. You only give me your You're starting high, okay. <laughs> But then you get Earth, Wind, and Fire. That's fun. That one is fun. I don't like that version of that song, but in that movie, I was like, oh, that's. I, I appreciated it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's say that. I was alone when I took a ride, didn't know what I'd find. Yeah. Another road where maybe I could see another side. nice to god forbid see some black people an hour and 18 minutes into the film and since welcome but apparently heartland is fucking mayberry yep yep um That's... so I, I i love earth wind and fire i love the voice of of, of philip bailey in general but this cover of got to get into my life i think we talked about in the cover show is in my top three i love i the, paul mccartney loved it so much he adapted how he ended the song when he did the uh, his very last tour with Wings. They added kind of the da 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 They added the horn riff to it. Oh. And McCartney did it live. That's how much he dug it. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then we get into, uh, yeah, so then, well, let's do it. This is one of my favorite parts in the whole movie. Aerosmith versus... <laughs> Peter Frampton and the Bee Gees. Well, and you, you, you know how well, I, you know how I feel about that. But I gotta stop you, Tony, because even though oh. we talked when I'm 64 briefly, I gotta get your thoughts on Frankie Howard's big number where he just mugs to the camera. Well, all I have written down is speak song. <laughs> You know, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Like it was the fourteenth time someone's just speaking lyrics instead of singing. And uh, yeah, but the worst moment is he doesn't speak. At one point, he goes. Right, jealous. He does sing it, and then the robot women uh, close their ears and start convulsing and being in robot <laughs> vocoders saying like, "Oh, don't sing." <laughs> You know, it's it's just bad comedy. It's like shitty fucking comedy. I, I think I was trying to block block that from my memory. It, it, I, I had to bring it up because in any musical, you've got like the the big comedy number before the end of the thing, right? Like you got sit down, you're rocking the boat, or Brotherhood okay. of Man. Like there, there's like we go together. There's always Is that how that works. Okay, yeah. There's you always try. I mean, you're not going to get in like a West Side Story or like a Fiddler, but in like musical comedies. You often have like a big comedy number there toward the end of the second half to give one big thing before you then ride out the arc and kind of make your oh. your resolution. So that seems shoehorned in there. But the problem is he's kidnapped her. And the problem is he's <laughs> holding her hostage. He sh There's a lot of gagging on masks in this. She gags on a mask. Steve Martin briefly gags on a mask. Right, there, right. There's a lot of mask gagging in, in, in this film. It's kind of pro-MAGA that way. <laughs> 
It, it's totally pro MAGA. They're gagging on masks because you don't need them. Presciently MAGA, <laughs> <laughs> which is my favorite precious moment. <laughs> Figuring we have we have one of their ornaments for our Christmas tree. <laughs> so uh, Aerosmith, uh, I, you know I'm not an Aerosmith fan. This version of Come Together, however, is a great, great Beatles cover. I think it's not bad. Yeah, it's what they do. Yeah, they're doing the homoerotic thing on one microphone, uh, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry. Uh, Joe Perry looking very good with – got the streaks in his hair. Um, they play a band called the Future Villain Band, which is – I wrote accurate. <laughs> it is accurate. Because <laughs> they did become villains, really. So, right. So the whole – I don't know what the point is. The, the, they're about money, I guess. That's – whatever. That's the deal. They're villains, this uh, Aerosmith. And then the Bee Gees come in there with Andy Gibb and a, and a full-on hand-to-hand combat scene erupts while they're playing Come Together. And uh, Steven Tyler's, like, kind of creeping on her and kind of rubbing his body up against hers and whatever. It's horrible. Although, in fairness, he had just been doing it this to uh, Joe Perry. Right. Yeah, equal. Was... And maybe Steve Perry. <laughs> <laughs> and Tyler Perry. <laughs> Tyler Perry is Steve Perry in Medea separate ways. You want some more sandwich? Yeah. You say yes, ma'am, to me. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> he said yes, ma'am. <laughs> oh my God, I would love to see that. That would be great. That's see, that's how we that's how we would bring our two worlds together. We do one of those. So yeah, uh, Aerosmith. Uh, uh, we it, it answers the age old question: Who wins in a fist fight, Peter Frampton or Steven Tyler? And I knew Steven <laughs> Tyler was a pussy, so it all makes sense. <laughs> the dude looks at a lady, and they, so he's loving an elevator. And fuck you, I was crying when I met you. Of course you were. So Peter Frampton yeah. wins, but in Steven Tyler getting killed. Strawberry Fields proves not to be forever because for a brief time anyway, she gone. Yeah. Steven Tyler is thrown off of a two story stage. She gone! <laughs> Both time. <laughs> <laughs> and is presumably dead. And then out of some sort of electronic mishap. So, too, the Strawberry Fields, Sandy Farina, comes crashing down. I think I think the actual dummy that they used in the wide shot breaks in half. <laughs> but they cut away. You big dummy. She was a talented young woman who got cast in a bad, in a, in a bad thing. She didn't work again too much after this either. Like, I, I tried to find what else she did, and it was like, I think she became a commercial singer. Like, she sings on, you know, commercials or whatever. Farina. Which is a living. I work on commercials, so I'm not knocking it. I'm pretty sure Sandy Farina is the one eight seven seven cars for kids. <laughs> Donate your car today. Yeah, I hope so, man. I hope she got. I hope she's got a percentage of that, man. I hope she got some points on that. <laughs> so now Strawberry Fields is dead, and and then Golden Slumbers begins with uh, Peter Frampton, very sad yet so unearned. <laughs> singing into her transparent coffin <laughs> when they all carry her down I, keep, I, I mean because you know that's not really a dummy because you don't want you know lepo no. gib carrying you how many takes you to do with that um yeah but man. i keep waiting for the casket the clear casket for her to kind of tip she doesn't move that's great acting that's method acting yeah she's good but like i think yeah you could tell one of those guys had a had a, a long like it was partying the night before i think it was um Paul Williams, I think, was <laughs> he's in the front struggling. Like that's the one it's part a, where the coffin's dipping. Like, uh, oh fuck, how many takes of this are we gonna do? I was up, <laughs> was up I'm till fucking four. Heart attack. My valves are closed. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so then Sandy Farina's in this clear coffin, and uh, long and winding road happens, which starts with the second verse, which is funny. Peter Frampton knocks over a life-size cardboard cutout of himself and then decides to commit suicide. Another ad for the movie. There's one last desolate ad for the film. (laughs) Right? Yeah, he knocks over his cardboard cutout and on the other side it says like, $1.99 for (laughs) (laughs) H-Rap. 
<laughs> Get your T-shirt. And so, and then they sing a day in the life that you refer to, where a pack of wolves known as the Bee Gees begins to unendearingly sing a day, the nonsense lyrics. They might as well be singing "I'm the Walrus" at that point. Right. In the movie. Exactly. They should have just done I'm the walrus there. Or honey pie. Wild honey pie, I mean. Wild honey pie. Well, and, and, and the Dave Dexter version of this movie, yeah. I'll Get You, happens in the scene. Oh, yeah. With I'll a fold over stereo mix. <laughs> like, oh, it's duophonic. I don't know what it means, but I hate it. <laughs> And it's 2.1. <laughs> Dude, I got the Beatles' second album remixed in 2.1. It's great. <laughs> it's great. Uh, so yeah, everything that's on the left is now on the right. Wow, it's a change your life. Man. And everything that was on the right is just gone. They've totally taken it out of the mix. It's all left channel, but on the right. <laughs> Get it? That's what it needs to be. All left channel, even on the right. See what we there just did go. there? Go there vote, you, go. you dummies. Vote. Oh, um, Dave Dexter for Treasury. <laughs> now, listen, if Biden is going to impact the courts, he should bring in Dave Dexter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dave Dexter, Murray the K, Pete Best, get all the fifth Beatles on the court. <laughs> and let's get that goddamn all things must pass out. Can, can, can you believe that the fifth Beatles Supreme Court finally reissued the 50th plastic ono band and overturned Roe v. Wade? What the fuck's Lawrence Juber thinking? I don't know why Lawrence Juber would be afraid of that. It felt like that random wing. Um, so right as Peter Frampton's about to kick it in what I think one of my, another one of my favorite Beatles covers, I said this in our cover show, the, I have, I did, I never looked at it in this way until recently, but I think the best Beatles covers are done by black artists and Billy Preston doing get back is another great example of just, first of all, he played on the original, which is helpful. Yes. So yeah, he was it's there. <laughs> finally, a goddamn connection to the actual Beatles that George. One of the George few Barnes people fucking up. Yeah, yeah, one of the few one people. One of the few people that was actually there. Well, uh, Carol Channing was, <laughs> was with them in India. But diamonds are the best friend. Cynthia missed the train. Carol Channing did not. Hello, darling. <laughs> Yeah, what's the new Mary Jane? It's about Carol Channing. Mary Jane. That's my name. Oh <laughs> so, Lord. But Billy. No, I'm going to agree with you though. Yeah. yeah, Billy Preston comes in in, and he is the most authentically joyful element in this yes! movie. It's the first moment of joy. Two hours and ten minutes into it, there's joy. Yeah, it's real. The only thing in this movie that's not cardboard cut out. It's it's real. And yeah. And he's hilarious, right? Because his finger makes lasers come out of it <laughs> and turn people into priests and nuns and bishops. And po- and bishops. <laughs> Yeah, so Billy Preston is a weather vane that comes to life, right? This is a weather vane that you've seen through the whole movie that makes moog noises. Like, <laughs> like every- <laughs> the guy playing the moog is doing it in a Sergeant Pepper logo t shirt, even off camera. Can I keep this? <laughs> Yeah, so he comes in and he sings uh, Get Back, right? And he's telling everybody to get back, right? It it is great. And also the lyrics, like when he's singing, because he brings Sandy Farina back to life and looks at her and goes, get back, JoJo. Your mom is waiting for (laughs) you. And I'm like, when did Strawberry get the nickname JoJo? JoJo and also Loretta, right? (laughs) Call someone else Loretta. It's like, (laughs) he's great, but he doesn't know anybody's name. Get back, Loretta. Your mama's waiting for you. With a high heel shoes and a low neck sweater. Get back. And then here's the other thing that I thought was hilarious is that so Peter Frampton is going to die by jumping off of a two story structure. <laughs> <laughs> and they do. Do you? You. <laughs> feel like I do. Do you feel? Um, 
and they do a great special effect, which is just stopping the film and freeze framing it and then putting it in reverse. And that's Billy. That's Billy Preston's doing with his laser finger. And he makes Frampton. Come, Come alive. alive. Yes, thanks. That's this week's episode. Be <laughs> you told me, I'm so glad you pulled that line. Yes, Billy Preston makes <laughs> Rampton come alive. It's so funny. And you're right, because Billy Preston, I mean, uh, Peter Fremen starts to die and his body kind of curves. He's not dying flat. His body almost becomes like a V shape. Yeah. So when he, it, it's a, it's, it's freaking weird. And also a great message. Like, uh, first of all, suicide is not funny. No. And anybody who would, would feel like that that desolate should know that they're not alone and there's numbers to call and people to talk to. But it's, it's a goofy way to jump off a building and then wind up in like a V. Because like, you only do one take. You don't want to really kill Peter Frampton. Well, to be clear, I'm pretty sure that's a double. I'm pretty sure you should. Oh, dude, dude, dude. Peter Frampton always did all his own stunts. Peter Frampton's the original fall guy. Well, I'm not the kind to kiss and tell, but I've been seen with Farrah. I love that. Farrah. I loved that I theme. I watched, I, I, my favorite scene was the overhead shot of the guy crashing through the window. I loved that. Anyway. I could dunk a tall building or a tarzan from a vine. Cause oh. I'm the unknown stuff, man. That made me Eastwood looks so fine, one. yeah. East, that's right. Yeah. Clint Eastwood is not in this. Sadly, he is not in this. No, he was yelling in a chair at the RNC at the time. Uh, <laughs> so I've got um I've got Mr. Obama sitting here. Uh. <laughs> So that is kind of the ultimate, that's how the movie ends, and they bring it back for the world's first attempt at We Are the World in the form of a <laughs> Sgt. Pepper album cover uh-huh. remake of, again, the Who's Who Is That? of 1970s stars. It's the Sgt. Pepper finale. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, a quick – I'm pretty sure – here's what I wrote down. Uh, I wrote the, the finale is a cocaine-fueled nightmare of 70s entertainment. Bowser, Tina Turner, Dr. John, Dame Edna, yeah. Jacko from Shadana, Curtis Mayfield. Curtis Mayfield's in, in there. Uh, Keith Carradine, I think one of the last Wilson Pickett sightings. Yeah, Wilson Pickett is in it. Helen Reddy. Peter Noon. Now, here's something about Peter Noon. Uh, Herman's Hermits, right? If you type in Peter Noon into your computer, it's going to autocorrect it to Peter No One. (laughs) (laughs) That's my favorite song on Revolver. (laughs) So poor Peter Noon, his legacy in autocorrect erases him. He's autocorrected out of history. (laughs) Thank God for autocorrect. I'm every I am. Shut up, Peter Noon. Bonnie Raitt is in it. Rick. Oh, uh, did, did I mention that Peter Noon is actually Peter Eleven Mountain? <laughs> <laughs> that was a way homer for me. <laughs> Peter Eleven Mountain. Uh, and uh, Rick Derringer from Rock and Roll Hoochie Coo. Donovan is there. Cheetah Rivera. Connie Stevens. Leif Garrett is not Leif Garrett. Leif Garrett. Seals and Crofts. Hart is there. Hank Williams Jr. Before, Williams Jr. before football. <laughs> All his rowdy friends like Carol Channing were coming over that night. Jose Feliciano was there. Yes. Bobby Womack, Jackie Lomax, Frankie Valley. You mentioned Wolfman Jack. Etta James was there. Etta James. It is the most random who's who. I will say it's cool to see so many artists of color in this movie. Grease and Sarah Nefeva were not known for their they're uh, black actors in either ensemble. Neither is this movie, but it's cool. Like it's cool to see Tina Turner. It's cool to see Curtis Mayfield. It's cool to see Wilson Pickett. And it's it it's horrendous. And the <laughs> orchestration. <laughs> George Burns arguably what's so weird is when they list the cast shouldn't he get a and featuring George Burns he's locked in with the cast that's the one thing that's wrong with this movie yeah. <laughs> it's the credits <laughs> get me Bob Stigwood and it was never yeah. the same I mean this movie was a critical joke 
to your point, it did make some money. It didn't lose money, but it made so little compared to what they were expecting. It made six million dollars as yeah. opposed to two hundred million with the other movies. Like it, it barely broke even. In other words, so you're saying Robert Stigma was the six million dollar man? <laughs> I am. I am. Yeah, those strange sound effects chased him everywhere he went. <laughs> or I'm thinking of the Bionic Woman. I love those Bionic Woman sound effects. They're the best. <laughs> The guy playing a Moog in a Sergeant Pepper T-shirt is, is what all that was. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that was his day job. So this uh, th- this album, I mean, it, they shipped a ton of copies. I read a couple things online saying that that this album may be the most shipped back to uh, to uh, the record company of any album in history because every store stocked up on all this, right? And initially, it sold. I think it was number five on the charts for a week or two, and then like some albums kind of go oh it's five it's 11 now it's 20 this album like slipped off the billboard charts within a couple of weeks and everyone talked about how bad it was you will never in a used record store at a reckless or an amoeba find a copy of this that that looks worn everybody played it <laughs> once or twice and went well, that's interesting that was bad i'm good <laughs> I think you just totally summed it up right there. That's beautiful. Well, you got to see it. It's great. We give it 10 stars, 10 fabs, must see movie. It kind of is. If you're a Beatle weirdo, uh, it's definitely a must see. And we chose it with Halloween kind of being when this thing's going to air around them because it's a costumey album. You know, uh, oh, yeah. the Bee Gees are dressed like wolves. <laughs> and that's just their <laughs> natural look. <laughs> Another interesting bit of trivia about this movie and it, it, interesting trivia, maybe a stretch. This didn't see release on CD until about a decade ago. This thing was oh, never... I was going to say, I didn't, I've never seen it on CD, ever. Yeah, I, again, I don't think it sold many copies, but Shout Factory just issued a Blu-ray of this. If you need this on Blu-ray, consult a local physician. <laughs> if you need to, uh, like, well, I got to see this. I got to see Billy Preston, you know, save a, a suicidal... Uh, suicidal Peter Frampton is also the MASH theme, which is, <laughs> which is another bit of TV trivia. When Peter Frampton <laughs> looked down low <laughs> Saw his soul and there it goes <laughs> I'm going to see if you can... Cue the helicopter. (laughs) Yeah, cue the helicopter. Uh, Next episode, we're going to talk Ringo's Bad Boy. I think we have a lot of (laughs) elliptic traces on a cigarette. Is that, should that have been an Abbey Road instead of Octopus's Garden? I think Tony's going to just do a solo show about that. Take it, Tony! Untitled Beatles Podcast. Like and subscribe.